Okay, great. Sweet. I think I think we're live. We're ready. All right. I'll go ahead and start a little intro. So, uh, yep, Austin back again with the AWS Meetup Group. Uh, we have David Sol here today to talk about the future of IT and serverless computing. I know we've had a lot of serverless talks and uh, super excited to have you on to talk today. So thanks for coming on. And um, yeah, so this is going to be a good long talk and I'll pass it over to you. I'll go ahead and pin you on the chat for Zoom and take it away. Let's see. Hello, good afternoon. And thank you very much for joining us to this talk, serverless computing, the future of IT. First of all, I want to thank you all, and especially Austin and Kevin, for giving me this opportunity to, to talk to you, to, to tell you about serverless computing and cloud, which is dear to my heart. I feel young again with this. And uh, invite you to, to subscribe to their group, the AWS Meetup group. We will share the, the presentation at the end. So don't worry, you will have access to all of this. So please join them, join the YouTube group, the YouTube channel, the Medium page, and the Twitter. Me, I am David Sol. I work at T-Systems Mexico as Cloud Architect. I'm part of the AWS Community Builders. It's a great program. If you ever have the opportunity of joining that program, is fantastic. And you can find me at Twitter as Soldavit Cloud. And I have to say, I put my helmet of AWS always, and I'm going to give this kind of talks. So we will start with the story. Long time ago, 120 years ago, 130 years ago, factories used steam engines. They used these uh, big engines that use uh, steam, that use coal, and they use wood to heat water and create the steam. And this steam moved huge engines and that power was used to power the factories. And I want you to, to see this uh, factory photograph. You can see these lines on the top, these uh, pipes, which, which they use to, to give power to the machines. The objective of these, uh, of these pipes on the top was to, to spin and move the, all, the, all the machines below them. What was the objective? The objective was to pass the power of this huge uh, engine, this huge heat engine to power the factory. And 120 years ago, a revolution came. And this revolution was electricity. These heat engines, these uh, steam engines were very heavy, were dangerous, were difficult to control. You couldn't turn them off because once the, the engine was running, to let it cool and to let it uh, heat up again, take a lot of effort. So it wasn't practical to start and stop the engine. It was easier to have the engine running 24 seven and have the factory running 24 seven to have the machines working all the time and have all the laborers all the workers in the factory in shifts working all day all night all days you didn't stop for weekends you didn't stop in nights you keep working and working and when you have an electrical engine you can start and stop it. There is no problem if you want to start or stop an electrical engine. So they change these steam engines for electricity engines. And guess what? 
they didn't saw an improvement because what they do, what they did was to take this huge steam engine and put in its place a huge electrical engine. And if you stop the electrical engine, all the factory stops. So it doesn't work. You need the electrical engine to be on all the time and you keep all the machines working and you keep all the laborers, laborers the workers, 24 seven. So what they said is, uh, okay, I changed my steam engine for an electrical engine and things keep the same. I don't see a big improvement. I don't see a big uh, gain in, in the workplace or in the, in the profits of the factory or a change in the way I work. I don't see changes. It works more or less the same. And if you saw the, the books and the, and the newspapers 120 years ago, that was the, the thing you saw on them. A lot of big industrialists make the change to electricity and they didn't saw the promise of it. They didn't saw the, the big advancement they were hoping for. So what was the problem? why they didn't saw the, the advantage of electricity. The problem was they didn't change the factory. If you really want to take advantage of electricity, you need to change the way the factory is set up. You don't need these big poles moving all the machines at the same time. What you need to do is to have a lot of small electrical engines each machine, each one of these hundreds of, uh, of machines, each one of them can have its own electrical engine and they work great. And each one of them can be turned on and turned off at their own pace. They don't need to be working all together at the same time. And you can move the factory around, you can move the machines. So they are not set up to to get advantage of the power they are receiving, you can set them up depending on the pipeline of the work you want to do. You can sit, you can put different kinds of machines one next to the other to make the flow of production better. You don't need to depend on this big X axis to move, to move everything. When you see that, when you realize you can change the pipeline of production and you can take advantage of a small electrical engines, because an, a small steam engine doesn't make any sense, but a small electrical engine, is, it's perfect. Then you see the advantage of moving to electricity. And if you are able to do that, and if you are able to change your factory, to take advantage of electricity, you can be more productive than the factory that uses steam. And we have the confirmation of that 120 years later. Today, there are no more factories that use steam. All of them use electricity because it's more efficient. But you need to change the way your factory works. The factory is set up. That's the moral of the story I want to give you is not enough to change the engine. You need to change the way you work. Okay. Let's let's start at the beginning. What is the cloud? And let's do this uh, more or less quickly. Because of marketing, sometimes we call cloud everything and anything. But let's say there are some characteristics of the cloud that are basic that if you don't have them, maybe you have a very automated data center or you have some very nice uh, software you can use, but it's not really a, a cloud. What do you need for the cloud? One, at the start, the basic is you need virtualization. The thing you are using in the cloud are virtual appliances. 
virtual computers, virtual network, virtual storage. When I ask for a, for a server in a cloud, it's not like in the Flintstones that uh, a monkey gets out of a box and quickly go and gets a, a server from, from a box and connect it in a rack and quickly connect the, the network cables. No. In fact, what is happening is we are creating a virtual computer. When we set up the the network addresses for it when we set up a network a load balancer when we set up a, a private cloud it's not like something is putting a, a router and connecting cables on it no that's not happening what is happening is we're creating a virtual network a virtual load balancer in in a physical infrastructure that exists and doesn't need to change why is virtualization important? It's really important because it allows to be very flexible, to be very quick. We don't need to go and get something from a box and connect it and find a physical space to put it in. Okay, that's nice. That works great. What's the second thing? We want to automate that. We don't want someone doing it by hand. When I call, AWS, or I call another cloud provider and I tell them I need a hundred servers, it's not like someone very quickly in their keyboard and in their mouse is creating these hundred virtual computers. Why? Because it doesn't scale. If they have to do it manually, if they have to go and create them one by one, as we grew in the number of resources we're going to use, we would need more people. It wouldn't scale. It wouldn't allow me to have a lot of, uh, of services. I would start needing hundreds and thousands of people and to organize them. I'm going to need dozens of managers. It, it wouldn't work. What we need is to do it automatically. I can say to the, to the cloud, give me these 100 servers. And that is going to happen by a program. It will be automated. So it's the same to create one, 10, 100, or 1,000. It's going to take the same effort for, for me. So what was the, the genius? of the AWS when they start doing this. They say, okay, if I'm going to have virtual infrastructure and the creation and the operation of this infrastructure is going to be automated, maybe I can sell it. If it's going to work very nicely, if it's going to be very good for me, for my business, for Amazon as a, as a bookseller, maybe I can sell it to other people but again, if I'm going to have someone in the phone getting the orders, okay, you need 100 computers, and then typing it or, or clicking the mouse to create the, one, the 100 servers, that is not going to scale. It will become a problem. So what I'm going to do is to allow the people to create their own infrastructure by themselves. I won't be in the middle. I will give them some solution, some mechanism, so they can create their own infrastructure, self-service. So we are doing the creation for them. Instead of calling them and asking them from, from, for the servers, we are doing the work ourselves. And they gave us the APIs, they gave us the the CLI, they gave us the SDKs, they gave us all these infrastructure as code uh, tools, so we can do our own infrastructure. And then it gets even better. If I can create my infrastructure and it's automated, I can be elastic. And we all have seen it. 
when we create a system and we need this system to to serve hundreds or thousands of, of users the load in the system is not constant it's not like all the people is working at the same time we have more loads in work hours and less load in the nights or if we we give uh, movies like netflix there are hours in the afternoons when the load is much bigger than in the middle of the day or in the dead of night and before we have to offer over provision there was no other choice we have to to say okay the maximum number of servers i will need is a hundred okay let's put a hundred and ten just in case but in real life less than half of them are working at the same time most of the time they they are not doing anything because most of the time we are not working at peak, at peak usage so we lose money we have to lose money because there is no other way it would be ridiculous for me to say okay in the night let's take out the servers like let's turn them off and then in the morning let's start uh, turning them on when they are needed it wouldn't scale it wouldn't work i cannot do that i cannot stop and start the servers when i need them Man, if they are virtual and they are automated and i can do it by myself i can automate that elasticity i can set up a watch set up a monitor and depending on the load in the system create and destroy the servers that i need and that is wonderful one i don't need to over provision i don't need to pay for something i don't use and second i don't need to to guess capacity i will tell you the truth i worked years as system architect and and the dreaded question the question always happened was how many servers do you need for these systems for this system we're going to create how many servers do you need which is the size of the database what is the capacity in processor in space the system will consume the system will need and the question was i don't have any idea it's a new system i don't know if it's going to work I don't know if it's going to have more uh, load than I expect. If I have a, if the system is wonderful and great, maybe more people is going to use it than the ones I'm expecting, or maybe the system is not being, going to get used at all because things change. And if I ask for a hundred servers, maybe I'm not going to use even 10. So we guess we, okay i guess 20 and that's it now we don't need to do that and that's wonderful i don't need to guess how many servers i'm going to need i only need to to create an elastic architecture that is going to grow and it's going to shrink depending on the demand so i know that all the time i'm going to have the resources I need, and I don't need to our provision. I don't need to pay more. So that's great. I love that part of the cloud. Okay. And here's my problem with the concept of private cloud. The idea that I can build a cloud in the back of my house. If I if I create a cloud, if I because I can, I can buy these huge computers that will serve as hypervisors and install the software to set up a cloud. Okay, maybe I can do that. But the fact is, elasticity doesn't work anymore because I had to buy the, the computers. Even if I don't use them, even if I scale and I am elastic in my application, I bought the computers. I pay for them. It doesn't matter if if I use more or less of them. 
I am paying for them. So the elasticity went off the went off the window, and I have to create everything from scratch. So it's not really virtual. I need to do it, and if something fails, I need to physically fix it. So not everything is automated. So I start to see problems with this concept of I can set up a, a, a cloud in the back of my office and, and say it's a cloud. And the big problem I see, the big issue is the pay per use. The wonderful thing of elasticity, self-service, automation and neutralization is I don't need to pay more. I don't need to spend money in infrastructure I don't need. And I think that's very important in the cloud to, to control the cost, to, to eliminate the need to pay for over provision. These savings are very important. To be clear that uh, what I am paying is what I need to pay, not more, not less. And you say, okay, what does all of this have to do with, uh, with serverless? Okay, we will go get there. What has happened in the evolution to cloud? What we are seeing is an increase of abstraction. And we go to history again, I love history. 50, 60 years ago, if you want a server, you needed to build it. You could not buy a server. You need, you would have to, to build the electronic components of the server yourself. And I didn't put here, but they have very nice photographs of, of old computers where the engineers that build them were very proud of the fact they built the processors, they built the memory, they built the storage. It, no, it was not like I went to the store and, and buy my motherboard and buy my processor and buy my, my DIMM memory. No, you have to build it from scratch. So we move out of that. We start buying the hardware pre-made. We start buying the computers pre-made. And then we we need to build the, that sentence. And if you didn't have the, the opportunity of do it, it was very interesting. It was a nice experience to to say, okay, I go to this uh, to this space, to this building, and I need to set up a, a false floor. I need to set up a special ceiling. I need to take the air conditioning in, in question, I need to see how I'm going to fix the, the racks on the ground, because if you don't do it, they sway like in the sea. It happened to me, the racks move around, and we need to fix that and, and make them not move around so much. It took time. It took effort, it took money to, buy, to build a data center. So someone had the idea of, I can build a data center and rent the space to you. So you don't need to build your own. You can bring your servers and put your servers in this data center. And that was called colocation. You rent the space and you don't worry about the air conditioning, the power, the, electricity was a problem you need to make sure when you build your own that center to make sure you are not going to lose power was a big issue a big concern and then someone said okay we have a, we can have the computers and bring the computers to you so you don't need to bring the servers and, and put the servers in the rack i can have the servers and rent the servers and that was called hosting and that worked nicely in their time and then virtual virtualization came and we say okay we don't need to put computers we can get these huge servers these supervisors and print your virtual computers and that gives us a lot of flexibility because in hosting 
you have physical servers. So if you ask me for a server with twice the memory, I need to buy the memory. But if it's a virtual computer, I just need to assign more memory to the virtual computer and that's it. So it will wait and that's called infrastructure as a service. I give you the servers, I give you the, the network, I give you the storage, but everything is virtual. That's the great difference between hosting and infrastructure as a service. One is physical, the other is virtual. And then we say, okay, most of our applications are, are node applications or are uh, probably on Rails applications or are Django applications and they are similar. They have the same platform, they have the same base and your code is constructed on top of this platform. Maybe I can give you the platform and, and we are going to talk more about it in a minute. And that we call platform as a service. I don't really rent you the servers, I rent you the platform on which to run your application. So if you see what we are doing is to increase the abstraction, deciding not to care so much in, in the things that doesn't make the difference. This uh, Gardner diagram, I like it a lot because it shows us what is happening from when we have everything in an on-premises uh, infrastructure and how we are moving into location hosting infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and even software as a service, when we only have our data running in someone else's application. And as you can see, what we are doing is letting someone else take care of the things that doesn't make a difference for us. And that's, that's important to understand. Maybe, maybe there are situations, there are cases where I prefer to use a traditional on-premises infrastructure. Why? Because maybe I have very strict security requirements. I don't have anyone to have access to my data for whatever reason, so I prefer to have it really in, in my offices. Or maybe I'm doing an application that is very specific and I need the hardware it runs on to be very custom made because I'm going to use specific electronic components, specific hardware configuration. So maybe collocation works fine with me. Maybe it's what I need. And like that, right? I can choose. It's not like, uh, no, no, everyone should move to, to software as a service. And if not, you are in a mistake now. There will be cases and we should be able to decide what is the correct level of, of abstraction for us. But most of us, there is a level that works. We're going to that. Um, I love this, uh, this graph from, from the last week in AWS. If you are not subscribed to these guys, this uh, it's a uh, it's an email every week with information about AWS. As the name says, I I cannot recommend you enough to su subscribe to this. And as you can see, this uh, this spectrum of compute, this evolution, this increase in the abstraction of our compute ability, it does have a, an arrow, it does have an increase in the abstraction. And that increase in abstraction can give us an advantage. What advantage? Okay, let's talk about it. And what we need to do is to ask ourselves, what do I need to run my application? Because what we need, unless you are 
hobby is if you are in this in, in technology information businesses to work in a company and you need to to use information technology what you want to do is to run an application you want to run your code your software that is going to help you help the business to prosper to give better service to gain more, more business to have more gains that's our purpose to run applications if you're a hobbyist and you love to to construct computers okay that's another thing but in a business setting what we need is to run applications what do we need to run them okay we need the hardware we need the physical infrastructure when this application is going to run and that hardware means we need to worry about where i'm going to put the hardware in i need a physical space i need power i need the uh, air conditioning i need uh, to to make sure that everything is compatible it's horrible to get the, the plug of the power and realize it doesn't work because the plug is different. Uh, it's horrible to put a uh, memory in a motherboard and realize it doesn't work. Okay, every, all of that you have to take care of. Hardware fails and it tends to fail when you less expect it and when it's worse for you. Processors burn, motherboards break, Part this uh, explode. It's uh, it happens, and you need to deal with that. You need to go check what what broke and change it, and you need to set up the network. And for me, for example, that never was a network guy. The network was like a, like a mystery, like a twilight zone, when some things happen, but to configure a router and configure all the things you need to set up in a network was really, really difficult, really, really esoteric. But without the network, you know, well, you have problems. And then after you have the computer set up and you have them in one place, you need to install all the operating system of the computers that sometimes sounds very easy, but sometimes very hard, especially if you want to optimize them to the application you're running and you want to make sure they are secure because installing them, well, that's easy, but to make sure that the operating system has been hardened so no, it's not like another country is going to come up again and get a uh, hold of your computer is not to be ransomware well there are careers about security of operating systems so it's hard and then you need to put the platform and you need to say okay i'm going to use a java application a python application and going to set up kubernetes that it's another <laughs> another area another play another dozen of books about how to set up Kubernetes. And after you do that, you can finally put your application. And what does every, all of this mean? What does it mean really? It means people. You need a team. You need experts in hardware, experts in how to set up the the things physically you need money you need to buy or rent the, the things you need the physical infrastructure and you need time it will take time to set up a physical data center and let me tell you something people you can get you can train money you can have maybe you can lend but time, time is a very precious resource and you cannot get more time. And what about the operating system? You need a different thing. You need different set of experts. 
you need money for licenses. You need money to train the team, to, to hire them, to make sure everything works. And you need more time. What about the platform? Yes, exactly. You need people to set up the platform. And you need this, and you need more time. And what about your application? You need another team of developers to build and maintain your application, and you need money for it, and you need more time. Okay, the cost, the sum of all of this, the sum of the people and their salaries and their training and the time it took me to, to hire them and to retain them and the sum of the cost of the hardware and the licenses and the and the so accompanying software the antivirus and everything and the time the cost of the time of all of this that's the total cost of ownership is what it takes us to run our applications. And we know it, and, and companies know the, that information technology has a cost. And it's something we know, it's something we have accepted, and it's always it's something that we are always trying to make small. We are trying to increase all the time. So, after all of this, and after seeing the cost of all, what is the value? Why, why are we doing all of this? Why, why do we put computers everywhere in our enterprises, in our companies? Because the applications give us value, because what we can have in the software, when, what we can automate in our processes, in our production, in our in our administration of the company give us value and this value should be and we would uh, like and we should strive to have this to to make this value bigger than the cost of the total cost of ownership we want this value to offset the, the effort we put in running the application but what is important to see here is the value is in the application. The hardware, the operation, the operating system, and the platform are necessary evidence. Something I need to do to get to the value, but it's not something that gives me the value. The value is in our application. It's okay, nice. All of these hardware operating system platform, we can group, we can put in one box and call it undifferentiated heavy lifting. Okay, maybe, 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 and it's true, maybe I can set up my data center better. Maybe I can do a very, very good work and, and set up the racks perfectly and the distance between them to be exact and perfect and the and the fire suppression system to be very efficient and maybe I can connect the computers very good and make sure all the cables are perfect and that can be that can make a difference that can make a data center better than another maybe I can configure my operating system I can optimize it and I can harden it better than, all, than another people. And that can make a difference. Maybe I can configure my Kubernetes and I can configure my, my Python or my Node in a better way and make the application run better. But the important thing to know, this, know here is that I have to in, Okay, if I'm doing a good work, if I'm doing it correctly, this difference I can I can get it's very small. For the effort that is going to take me to make it a little bit better, I'm going to spend 
team, money, and time. And it's going to be a lot of people, a lot of money, and a lot of time for a very, big, very little advantage. So there is a, a moment when something is good enough. When I can say my hardware is good enough, my operating system is good enough, my platform is good enough, it works fine, and let my application give me value. And, and if I invest more money and more time and more people in getting it better, it's not paying me anymore. It's not giving me an advantage that, that offsets the cost that it's going to take. That's why we call it undifferentiated heavy lifting, because something we spend money on, we spend people on, we spend time on, but the real advantage, the real value, it's going to be in the application. It's okay. Great, we have this own differentiated heavy lifting that we have to do because the application doesn't run on the air. And we have the application that gives us value. So what? What does that mean? Okay. What happens when we use infrastructure as a, as a service? When I go to AWS and tell them, okay, give me virtual servers, give me the network. And I love AWS for that. I don't need to know about routers and about switches and about cables and about how to, to connect an RGI 45 connector. No, I can tell them I need three subnets and I need four root tables and it works. And it works all the time. I don't have to worry about it. I love that. What is going to happen there? I don't have to care for the hardware. The hardware exists. AWS has the data centers and has the computers and has the switches and has the cables, but I don't need to worry about, worry about it. I don't need to deal with it. I let, I let the experts do it. I let them to do it. And I'm clear that they are going to do a better work than the one I could do. Uh, and beside it, maybe if I decide to, to study a lot, I could do a similar work. But I don't like hardware that much, to tell you the truth. I prefer to do applications. And what does that mean? That means that the team, the money, and the time I needed for the hardware goes away. And you're going to say, OK, David, you, you <laughs> deleted everything. Not really. There is a cost there. There is money. The money will stay. Maybe even the back of money, it's a little bit bigger. Okay, deal with me, okay? Uh, we know there is a cost there, but let's say there is a lot of things we don't need. People and time. And remember, the thing we cannot get more of is time. That's the real saving we're doing. What about our, our operating system? What about the platform? Okay, I, I forgot this. When I use infrastructure as a service, the total cost of ownership gets reduced. Even if I pay, pay more money, what I'm saving in people and what I'm saving in time makes the total cost of ownership less. And the undifferentiated heat lifting is less. And that's great. Okay, what happens with platform as a service? With platform as a service, I don't care about the operating system and the platform. That means I don't need the teams, the money, and the time, all of that. I can dedicate myself just to the applications, just to the part that gives me value. And that is great. That is the promise of platform, platform as a service. You deal with the thing you need, with the thing that gives you value. And the total cost of ownership gets smaller. And that means more gain for me. That means I can have a better, a better result for my application. 
Okay, in the case of AWS, infrastructure as a service is BCP, is RTS, is EC2. Okay, EC2 being the, the poster child of infrastructure as a service. And platform as a service, it's Elastic Beanstalk. It's the poster child of a platform as a service in AWS. Okay, David, uh, we haven't talked anything about serverless so far. Yes, <laughs> the idea is to, to be in the same channel, to have the same idea as all of us. And now we're going to see the next step in platform as a service. But let's take a, a short break, we'll move around, go for a drink. And if you have questions, now it's a great time to, to make them. You can do them in the chat or you can, uh, I'm not sure if you can mute if you're in the Zoom call, uh, you can also do it in audio. So we are ready. Have my questions here. Any questions so far, comments? Let me check the Zoom chat. Not sure how to see the, uh, here is the chat. If not, um, move around. It's important to, to exercise or for something to drink. So I don't see any questions so far. Uh, give me five minutes and we continue. Back in a minute.
So welcome back. Hey, Dimitri. So we are going back to another story. As you can see, I love stories. And this is this is the story of our applications, how we build them, how we, we architect them, how they work. And I hope, I sure, <laughs> I should, would love to, for all of you to see a good traditional application, to see a, a well-architected application. Because in the past, on mainframes, on client-server computers, on client-server systems, in our, in our application of web applications, there are some applications that are work of art, that they are precious, they are diamonds, they are perfect. We have hundreds and thousands of different parts of different modules, different tools, different databases, different technologies, all of them working next to each other, all of them talking between themselves, all of them working to a purpose. And they are perfect. They work, they work with the, with a beauty, and it's hard to to explain to someone that is not of, of uh, that does not work in information technology. To tell them, hey, this uh, database design, this application design, this uh, module, this uh, this function, is a work of art. It's beautiful. It's efficient. It's clear. It works, it's optimal. And the only way to tell them, the only way to explain to them these, uh, these things is to compare it to, to a clock, to clockwork. We have all these pieces, all these small gears, all these small springs, these uh, small levers all working in harmony, all work perfectly in one next to the other, one fulfilling this function. Those are traditional applications. They are works of art. Most of them there. There are exceptions, but most of them, they are work of art. They are works of engineering. They are precious to us. When we build one of them, we, we go to our homes with a smile, very happy because we know we did a good work. We did something precious, something beautiful. But we have a problem. These applications have a problem. And the problem is when I ask you to change the gear in the middle, when I tell you the spring break, I may need to put a different spring, but it's not exactly the same spring because it's different. Or worse yet, when I tell you, okay, this clock is beautiful, it works perfectly, but I need you to put a new hand on it. I need you to put a different hand. I need you for the clock to do a different thing. And we need to change that. That is a problem. That is hard. Most of the time, we can do it, but the resulting system is not as good as the systems before it. We have to take shortcuts to make, take some cheats to allow us to change it, to allow us to put this new gear, this new hand, to change that spring for a different one. And in time, our clock looks bad. 
or drugs has issues or drug uh, accumulates technical debt. And we always told the same thing. They are asking me to change the wheel in the car, the tire of the car without stopping the car. And that is not possible, but it's not easy. That is very very difficult. Unless we design a car that let us change the tires while it's running. And we design it with that in mind. Maybe we put more tires. Maybe we put a different way of connecting the tires so it's easier to change them. So we need to architect our applications in a different way. So they are not like these clockwork mechanisms that are wonderful and they are beautiful, but they are not easy to maintain. They are not easy to improve. And change it for something different. Let us maintain the systems. Let us maintain the applications. Let us improve on them. Let us change one piece without making a mess of all the rest. Okay, how do we do that? The question is, what is the smallest thing we can do? We have these, these systems, these applications that are like clockwork with everything is connected to everything else. Everything is set up to be exact and be joined with everything else to be optimal or very difficult to maintain. And that we call a monolith. That is a monolithic application. It's a big piece that cannot be easily changed. So let's go to the other side. Let's divide this, this monolith. And to divide it, we need to know what is the smallest part, which, which is the atom of our applications, which is the part we cannot divide anymore. And we get to the function. This function, when I get a set of parameters, I let the function do their magic and it gives us a result. That is the smallest thing we can do. And we can build a system, build an application, design an architecture based on these functions and say, okay, everything is a function and all the functions call themselves, but they are not interlinked. They are separated. So I can change one function without affecting the rest of the system. And we call that microservices. So instead of having this monolithic application, beautiful and made to perfection and very hard to change, into this microservice architecture with everything is disassociated, everything is independent. They have communication, but they are not uh, all connected between them. And that let us change small parts of the system, small parts of the application without affecting the rest. They let us change the tires of our car without affecting the rest with the car moving. Okay, visually, how can we imagine that? If the monolithic application is a clockwork mechanism, microservices is a Lego set. We have these functions, these independent pieces that we can plug and play in a very easy and maintainable way. We can get these pieces pre-made, ready to go, and the magic is not how to put them in such a way they are optimal and beautiful and very hard to move. No. What we want now is how can I quickly assemble these pieces in a very easy to do way to have the result I want. 
because if they tell me okay this system looks great but i was imagining something different and we now need the things to be a little bit different we should be able to move the pieces around very quickly and have a different system but to change it and to maintain it should be very easy because we are using these pre-made pieces or pieces we build but they are interchangeable they use standard interfaces between them so that we are able to plug and play them and when we manage to do that when we manage to have a very good microservices architecture we can build huge systems we can build huge applications we can build enormous things beautiful things that are easy to set up are easy to maintain are easy to use that's what we want and that take us to a huge revolution i think it's going to be a very important date in the future when they study the story of the of techn information technology so they go away so they're going to say november 2014 when when aws release lambda as a function as a service that everyone can use as a very important date as a very important thing because it's the lego piece we are going to use it's, it's the smallest piece we're going to use to build these microservices architectures but it's not the only piece okay I, I, let me ahead of myself it's not the only piece we're going to use we need wheels we need sensors we need motors you say we not only work with functions we have a lot of other pieces a lot of different lego uh, pieces we can use to build our systems serverless is not only function as a service it's not only lambda it's also also storage it's also uh, this network is also distribution of content is a sappy gateway is a step functions is sns and sqs that is the the glue that will join our applications together all these services together with lambda is a basic pieces we are going to use to build our systems so now our work as architects as developers is not to build this clockwork mechanism that we are going to be proud of it no one else in the history of mankind is going to maintain because this made our image a, a way of thinking so when we move out to a different company the guy that have to take care of our application is going to say hey this is a work of art but i cannot maintain it because i don't know how he built it he built it because he is like that and it's a work of art it's something he built it's something precious to him but i don't think the same way but if we build the things with legos it's much easier to maintain it's much easier for me to get to maintain an existing system and know which pieces it has and change the pieces and move the pieces around because the interfaces are standard that's uh, the great wonder of uh, of these microservices architecture so to complement the graph we saw before the, the gardner one hosting collocation he has passed us how does it look now we have EAS infrastructure as a service we have container as a service we have platform as a service and we have function as a service and notice something I can imagine or I could say that function as a service 
is like an extreme of platform as a service. I have the platform put and running just a function, or I could think that function as service is like a container as a service, but with a very small container. But it's not. Why? Because function as a service is just part of the serverless architecture. Even if Lambda and function as a service is the poster child, is the most famous, most famous part of a serverless architecture, it's not the only one. All the other services are there. When we do a serverless architecture, we are using all these Lego pieces and we are building our application, we are architecting our application as this microservices application, Lego application that is easy to maintain, is easy to change, is easy to, to expand. And container as a service and platform as a service, they are not looking for this. I can perfectly build a monolithic application in container as a service and in platform as a service. The big difference in serverless is we are looking for a microservices architecture because we want to build these Lego-like applications that are easy to maintain, they are easy to, to deal with. Okay. If you don't know Lambda, what is it? We have functions, just one function. It's going to take parameters and it's going to give me a result. The Lambda is event driven. It's not like uh, I create 10 Lambdas and I have them waiting if work is needed. No, when something happens, the Lambda is going to be created, the Lambda is going to run, the lambda is going to give me the result and then it, it's going to disappear. Okay, it's not really disappearing. The important thing is you don't pay for it. You only pay for when the lambda runs. You don't need to have the lambda somewhere in a server or in a container or in a node or and pay for it if the lambda doesn't get executed. You are only going to pay if something happens and the Lambda net needs to run and the Lambda gives you the result. How much? 20 cents for a million executions and very little for each gigabyte of memory every second. In many cases, that means huge savings because you don't need to set up infrastructure that maybe is going to get used and maybe is not going to get used. You only pay for executions. Also, each one of these lambdas is each one of these functions runs independently of another of the others. And that means no more problems of concurrency, no more ah, they step on each other because they run at the same time and they make a mess of things. No. Each one of them runs in their own sandbox, in their own yard, and do their own thing. They should be fast, 15 minutes, 15 minutes max. So that could make some issues there. If you have a very long running process, okay, maybe this is not for you. And they are stateless. You are not expecting the second goal to the lambda to have the knowledge of the previous execution. As they all are independent, when you call a Lambda, it's the first time you are calling it. It doesn't know anything. It's starting from zero. All of them are stateless. And yes, it's a different paradigm to, to develop, and there is some there. We're going to, to talk about some in a minute. And there we have a, an example of a Lambda Basically, it's a function. You can see the dev lambda handler with the parameters, which is the event, the information of what happened, what was the trigger that executed the lambda, and the context that gives you information of where the lambda is running 
And in this function, you are going to do whatever you need to do. And once it's done, the lambda goes away. We talk about this, lambda is very important. Lambda is the poster child of serverless. But there are tens and hundreds of other services that are also serverless. And what do we mean by serverless if not functional service? We're talking that we don't really care of the server. You have used S3 and we can store objects there. When you call S3 and you retrieve an object and you store it, an object, there is a server there that is working and it's doing some work. But you don't care about the server. You don't pay for the servers. You only pay for the storage. Uh, CloudFront. CloudFront is thousands of servers, of web servers in all over the world. They are physical servers. They exist. But you don't care about them. You only say, I want my page to be served from the CDN, from CloudFront, but I don't care about the servers. I don't care if they are Nginx. I don't care if they are Apache. I don't care. I just want my page to load. The same with SMS, uh, a notification service, right? A publication subscriber service. There are servers there with operating systems and with hardening and with uh, hard disk and with needs of power and needs of cooling. But I don't care about it. I only need my, my topic there and I only need to send messages and I only need the subscriber to get the message. I don't want to care about all the rest. Because it's undifferentiated heat lifting. It's something that doesn't really give me value. The value is which message I am publishing and who is receiving that message. That's the thing that matters. Okay. As you have seen this talk, it's not about the how. I'm not going to tell you how to build a serverless application, how to migrate your precious and beautiful monolithic applications to these new serverless ones. We don't spend months and years talking about that. No, I think it's very important to know the, the why. Why we want to do a serverless application. What is the advantage of, of abandoning this monolithic application, this precious and beautiful clockwork applications and build these new level-like applications. And it's the value we can provide, the time we can save. I think the most important thing is the time. We can start doing our applications quickly. And we can give results fast. And, and that's true. You can get new people, you can get more money, but you cannot get more time. Okay, let's talk about what you need to take into account into a serverless architecture. When, well, when you do a serverless application, the first is the serverless architecture. You need to rethink the way the application is built. Because now the lambdas are going to run based on events, and you want them to be decoupled. You don't want them to be connected directly between them. Remember, you, we don't want this clockwork architecture again. We want a system, we want an application that when one part has issues or one part needs to be changed, it can be changed without affecting the rest of the application. Or if, we, or if one part has an issue, has a degradation in the performance or fails, the rest of the application can keep working and we can recover from it. And that means to build the application in a different way. And many people when see this, when they see a serverless architecture, they say, okay, it's really complex. It, my monolithic application that was very simple, that was very clear, it becomes this mess, it becomes this 
hundreds of different elements, each one connecting to others and each one more or less independent of the other. It looks really complex. And what we need to understand is that the monolithic of uh, applications were black boxes. They were very complex. And sometimes we forget how complex and how beautifully made they are. But we stop seeing it. After the application is finished, we see it as a black box and that's it. And we used to think uh, they were very simple, but they are not. They are really complex. What serverless applications are doing, what serverless architectures are doing, is to make that complexity apparent. It's clear for us to see it. It is shown to us. And that is very important because it lets us know how the system is built. It lets us change part of the systems. It lets us know where the system has an issue because we are able to see all the parts of it. We have access to the complexity inherent of the application that in a monolithic application, we got lost, we lost track of. So we should not get worried for seeing this architecture. It's normal, it's good, there's no problem for you. Vendor locking. Many people say, okay, if I build with serverless architectures, with serverless services of a cloud, because serverless is not unique of AWS. You can find serverless in all the cloud providers, more or less uh, with different characteristics. Yes, of course, but all of them has serverless services. All of them has function as a service. All of them has block store, object storage. All of them have a low balancing, serverless load balancing. All of them has a Dynamo DB equivalent database. No problem for that. But the issue is if I construct my application in AWS with serverless services, we are using Lambda, we are using DynamoDB, we are using SNS, we are using SQS. These are services exclusive to AWS. They are not exclusive. Well, we cannot use these services in other clouds. They are only for AWS. And the same goes for the other clouds. If you build your your serverless architecture, your serverless application in other cloud is with the particular services of that cloud. So many people get afraid that, uh, that you are locking in in a cloud provider, that you will not easily move from one cloud to, to another and that there is a problem, that there is something bad there or something to be avoided. And yes, we, if we can avoid the locking, it's better. It's something we should try to, if it's possible, why not? But in real life, it's not possible. When we decide that we're going to make our code with one language, that we're going to build it in JavaScript or in Java or in Python or in Go, we are getting locked in in that language. When we decide or our, our container is going to run on Windows or is going to run on Linux, we are taking some decisions there. And nothing happens. When we, we have lived decades with locks in. We have lived decades tied to Windows, tied to Office, tied to Oracle, tied to SQL Server. And not, it's not a big issue. And, and sometimes it's ridiculous because the companies are to the top and I love this, uh, this drawing from Forrest Barrer, Graziano. But uh, they are to the top of, of lock-ins, but they are very worried that they are going to get locked in the cloud. There is no problem. What you need to do, remember that we, we are going to run these functions as a service. What we need to do is 
for these functions to be very clear and to move these functions from one provider, from Lambda to another provider, it should be easy, especially if we use a, uh, an infrastructure as code to Okay, we would need to migrate, but it should not be very hard. It would be much easier migration, but try to migrate a database, for example. Okay, but we are going to use SNS and SQS and S3 that, that are particular service. Okay, but the wonder of those services uh, is that they work via an API, and that API is very simple, and the way we use them is very simple. <laughs> So to change one for the other, change the hook sub service, the SNS, for another service that does hook sub in another cloud, it is not that hard. Yes, you need to do it, you need to test it, but it's not like it couldn't be done. You can do it. It's easier than migrate a monolithic application, I can tell you that. And if you haven't seen the rules from Forest, go look them. They are great. They made me smile a lot. Development, which is it changes. We need to develop in a different way. The tools and the processes and the ways we use to, to use to develop our applications doesn't work serverless architecture we need to change we need to get new tools we need to learn new tricks we need to learn new ways of building the applications and i can tell you start with this guy with some serverless uh, application uh, i forget the name but it's uh, okay it's the the squirrel guy this works great for serverless applications uh, it's easy to learn it works great it lets you do a lot and do it quickly and that's very important remember money we can get as they say in Willy Wonka they print money more money every day people we can train or we can hire people is born every day people gets out of university every day or time that doesn't get back. That does, you cannot get more than Cost control. Ah, this is an issue. This, this is a, a, a subject to talk about. We were used to provision in advance, to over provision, but provision in advance. So we say, okay, I need six servers. We buy six servers and then we see how the hell we can make these six servers work. So the finance team in our companies, in our enterprises, they knew they had to buy six servers and after they buy six servers, they only need to depreciate these servers. That was it. No problem, the cost is fixed. We know how much is going to cost and then how much time is going to take to depreciate that cost, to recuperate that cost, and that's it. And the problem was, and we're moving away from, from development and technical work and more into a business per perspective. Our companies used to think of the information technology part of the company, the information technology division, the information technology area of the company as a cost center. It's something that costs money. And that means as a company, the goal the target, the vision in the future is to try to reduce this cost center. We, we want to make this cost less. That's, that's our purpose because it's a cost center is something that 
drinks money, that absorbs money, and takes the money away from the company. But that's not it. We don't use computers because we have a lot of money and we need some way to spend it. We use computers and we use systems and we do applications and we have technology inform information technology departments because they make us more productive. Because they make us gain more money. So we need to change the way we see the, the information technology vision not as a cost center, but as a profit center. It's something that makes me win money. And, if, and that is the graph I put there. And I, I want to try to explain it. What we need to do is to say to our business, each time I run my Lambda, each time the Lambda runs and it costs five cents to run. Each time that happens, the company gains 10 cents. Because when this lambda runs, I am selling something and doing something and fixing something. And what the lambda is doing, it brings money to the company. So as you can see the cost, which each lambda I run, the cost increases. If I run 10 lambdas, it costs 10 times more. If I run 100 lambdas, it, it costs 100 times more. But I should be able to tell them each time the lambda runs, I am gaining 5 cents. So at the same time, I'm incrementing the number of lambdas I'm running. I'm incrementing the money I win. So guess what? When I become a profit center, when, I, when my application is something that drives profit, I am not trying to reduce the cloud cost. I'm not trying to make the, the cloud invoice less. I want it to be bigger. Because the bigger the cloud invoice is, it means the profit is more. It means I'm making more money. I want to run the lambdas. I want to store the data. I want to use the, the SQS service. Because every time I use it, it means I'm making money. And that's very important. If we can make that change, if we can demonstrate to companies that our application and our systems are driving profit, everything changes. Okay. Uh, Forest Recial again. <laughs> Hey, but serverless is more expensive than uh, uh, a monolithic application. If I see the server cost, how much I pay for the EC2 instances where my application runs, and I compare it one to one with the cost of the lambdas, guess what? There is no much difference. Maybe the, the lambdas cost even more SMS service and SQS service, if I add all of that, it's more expensive than the EC2 instances. Yes, but you are ignoring a lot of things. I'm ignoring a lot of cost, that total cost of ownership I showed you at the beginning. You are ignoring that. You are ignoring that bottom of the, of the iceberg that is not usually seen but it's very important. If you are able to show this, to realize how much it costs you to maintain these traditional applications, and it's hard for, because there are things like slower innovation, and it's hard to quantify. It's hard to tell you, yes, that's $100 an hour. 
it's complex to, de to demonstrate that, but it's true. Serverless, let us move quickly. Let us respond to the market in an easier way. That's the beauty of it. Security, that's another problem. When we have this monolithic application, we could think that if we put a fence around the application, the application was secure. We only need to put this uh, perimeter security, and we are done. The problem with that is that if someone somehow managed to get inside the perimeter, we have a problem. And it happens. But in serverless uh, architectures, things change. We don't have a perimeter. We don't have this monolith we can protect. We have a, a lot of stuff, a lot of things disconnected one of the other. So what can we do there? Well, we have to realize it's like each function, each service, each goal is a different perimeter. So instead of having one perimeter, we have hundreds or thousands of perimeters. And that means we need to change the way we deal with security. The old tools, the old ways doesn't work. Okay, what do we do? What's the solution? The solution is zero trust. You need to think that all the calls to all the functions are insecure. All your lambdas, when they receive an event, you need to think that event can be an attack, can be a, a malicious party, can be a, a bad actor trying to mess up with your system somehow. And each function, each service has to be ready to deal with it. And how do we do that? Okay, there are books on how to do that, but these three parts are basic. These are things you have to do and you cannot stop doing. First, all access should be secure. All access should be authenticated. All your functions should expect to see credentials and see and validate that those credentials are valid. They should not trust in anyone. Second, each of your function or each of your services has to have the need needed. You have to suppose, you have to imagine that your system is going to be breached because it will probably be. Maybe it's probable that in one moment, someone will beat the authenticated access and will have access to a function or to a service that shouldn't have to and will try to escalate from there. So what you need to do is to give it the least privilege possible. So even if someone gets in your system, it's not able to do anything, not able to escalate from there. It's going to say, okay, I managed to enter the first microservice, but I cannot move from there. Perfect, that's the spirit. Even if they are able to breach one of your perimeters, there will be a hundred more they have to breach. Third, you need to lock the things and inspect the things. And this is something to take into account because we have a lot of services now. We don't have one monolith and we can check this monolith and this log and everything is there. No, now we have a hundred different logs and different logs of different services of different functions, each one of them doing a different thing. So to, to consolidate these logs and to inspect these logs and make sense of these logs, is a challenge, it's something we need to do, it's something we need to take into account. It can be done and it should be done. And, and the recommendation here is you need to, to have this token, this identifier, that when you do one operation, when someone says, I want to buy something, you need this number that will flow 
in all the microservices, in all the functions, in all the services, so you can identify that operation because that simple operation, that simple byte, it's going to become a lot of events, a lot of messages running in a lot of different functions. You need to be able to consolidate on the logs and identify everything that happened with that transaction. And that means you need to build it. It's not something that will happen by itself. You need to do it. But once you do this, this can be much safer than a monolithic application. Debugging. And I invite you to see this, uh, this guy. I love the uh, comics, as you can see, monkeyuser.com. I love the, his animations and his drawings. Debugging is a challenge because it, now the information and the process flows between different services and different functions. It's not as easy as when we have the monolith and we know everything once in the same place at the same time. Now, one operation, one transaction can flow in different parts of the system and run asynchronously in different functions and pass via different services and join at the end. And we see that something is not good. Okay, to trace back what the problem was, it's a challenge. We need to change the ways we debug our applications. It can be done especially if you set up a correct logging mechanism and you have the tokens to identify transactions. And I, I can tell you, if you build the application okay, you can debug applications very easily, but it's different. We need to change you know, to, to do this. And, and we go back to my first story. Remember that it's not, it's not uh, only to change the steam engine and put the electricity engine. No, it's not as easy as that. You need to change the way you work to really, to really get an advantage of this. So to finish, what is serverless? Serverless is not, okay, there are no more servers. Okay, that's not true. So the hardware exists. The, that centers exist, the platforms exist. Server levels means we are going to worry less about the servers. We don't want to spend people, money, and time on the undifferentiated heavy lifting of supporting the hardware, the operating system, and the running platforms. We want to spend our efforts or teams or money and our time in the application, in what makes us have a, a gain for a company, what, what gives us an advantage, a competitive advantage. And that is the application code, what we really do, what really set us apart of the competition. And we can see it in this graph as the evolution of how much I am worrying or focusing on the application I'm building, on the logic of my business, from bar metal to, fo to function as a service. Each time we are dedicating more time in our code and less time in other things. But on the other side, we are letting the control go. When we are in serverless, when we use lambdas, we have all these conditions, right? The, the events are going to get in a standard way and the lambdas only can run 15 minutes. And they are run in this way and they will have gold starts if they are gold start. And you need to make your code in a certain way. Yes, you have these restrictions. But when you learn to use these restrictions and, and not to be bothered by them, you can spend more time in your application. You can spend more time in the things you care about. So that's it. Thank you so very much for, for joining us. And uh, we have time for questions and answers. First question is, yes, that those are my rights, two of them. Uh, so if any one of you have a question, 
now it's a great time to do it. And if not, thank you very much. Don't forget to subscribe. Uh, let me I didn't, uh, I didn't do it, but let me copy the the link so you can all have the the presentation if you want it. Don't worry. All the things I took from Forest and Corey Queen and and uh, user monkey is taken without their permission but with care and love because i like their work a lot Dimitri says to me modular applications feel simpler but yes when you learn to to work in a modular application it's simpler and i would tell you even when we build these monolithic applications a veteran developer a de veteran architect even in a model in a uh, monolithic application, it tried to decompose things. It tried to make modules independent of each other. Even in a in a monolithic application, because it's easier to maintain. It's a good idea. You learned that the premature optimization is the root of all evil. Remember, so to make these clockwork mechanisms, maybe they are beautiful. But uh, if you see it in the long run, they are, they are very hard to maintain. They are a bad idea, right? Even if they are beautiful. Maybe they are works of art, but they are hard to maintain and to increment and everything, right? So is another question? Let me check the... YouTube. No, I don't see any more uh, questions. Thank you very much. I, I remain in your service. You can find me at Twitter. And thank you so much for joining. Yeah. Well, thank thanks for your time, David Soul, and you know for you know talking about you know the difference between the monolithic and the um, the microservice architecture and you know how you know serverless you know, you know goes into that exactly well it was my pleasure thank you very much for the invitation i enjoy doing this uh, i think it's important for all of us to to move on ahead to, to take the to give more value to our companies drive better business results and I think this is what cloud is about. Yeah, like you know, you did when you were noted about you know how you know everything you know has the three components of of um, you know manpower, manpower, time, and and you know, money resources, resources <laughs> in order to get anything to work. And, you know, which you know the most critical one you put you know is time, <laughs> time. Yes, and and we many times forget that the time is the only thing we cannot get back or get more of yep and you know how basically you know the you know the quicker you make the application you know or like the quicker you know time to market basically <laughs> you know the faster you can you know actually start doing something <laughs> react to the situations, react to the competition, react to an opportunity that is very valuable. And we often ignore it, that to be in the opportune time, it's very important. It's a very big competitive advantage yeah. to be able to respond quickly. And, you know, from like, you know, my personal experience, whenever I think about monolithic architecture, I just, you know, usually think of like, you know, a nightmarish, like, you know, you know spaghetti, a lot of spaghetti <laughs> code that is like, you know, matched together. Like, it happens. Like, <laughs> with like a good example yes. of, you know, I've been like 16, 
functions with one parameter parameter being passed through and then only being used once and then someone removes it and then nobody knows why <laughs> exactly you have these systems that that are magical and and anything you move everything you touch <laughs> everything starts to rattle and everything starts to fail and you say okay move it back, <laughs> leave it as it was, because I don't know what's happening. That's very common in, in monolithic applications, right? Mm -hmm. And you end up putting a, a, an extra thing on top of everything, just to make sure you don't mess with the existing code base. And that's technical depth. You're adding weight to something until it's not uh, maintainable anymore. And, you know, it's a lot easier like you know with a microservice service where oh if you need to make a change all you need to do is make one change on the back end and then one change on the front end and if you do if you like you know make the pages you know correct correct then you know the pages are autonomous from each other and so it's like oh you can easily track down down exactly what happened and, uh, and you know that seems you know and you start doing a canary test and you start doing canary releases and green blue releases and everything starts flowing and that's great when you manage to get these applications then you can do continuous delivery continuous integration and and your work flows that's great and you know because of that it's like you know my personal aesthetic when it comes to code is like how fast can I track down if something breaks? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly and if, that. And if I can't track it very quickly, then that code is ugly, <laughs> basically. Yes, it means you have a problem there. Mm -hmm. And a big one. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, well, I guess, you know, the question for Austin. Yeah. So is Ian helping you anymore? Uh, no, I've, um, Ian's got a got a baby on the way so he's been doing his yeah i've heard about that that's a big project yeah <laughs> yeah talk about having <laughs> a, all these problems with uh technology then you gotta have the human problem involved that's a big one <laughs> that's one he's working right. through so um yeah th th uh, I, david i want to say like thanks a ton for jumping on and doing this this was like super awesome and uh yeah i i shared the uh slideshow on the um YouTube uh, link and I'll add that to the description as well so that'll be there so people can see that um, if everybody whenever people come to the YouTube video in the future uh, so yeah if you have anything else that you'd like me to share I can put that in there just message me on slack um, with any other links that you may have but uh, yeah thanks a ton this is awesome thank you for the invitation it was a blast for me and, and good luck to everyone take care the pandemic is still there even if it doesn't seem like it Mm -hmm. Hopefully, mm -hmm. hopefully coming to a wrap soon but I'm going to go ahead and, and end the stream and we can still be on Zoom but I'm going to go ahead and give it a close um, and that sweet alright stream is